In this video, we'll look at the notch filter. We'll cover the filter theory and practical implementation in software on an STM32 microcontroller. For the practical demonstration, I'll be using my little brain board, which I featured in many of my previous videos. Thank you also to Altium for sponsoring this video. Due to the current chip shortage, I've created an updated version of the little brain board called the little brain plus plus. You can also find this in my GitHub page. This board was designed using Altium Designer and I have a video showcasing the main design stages on my channel. If you would like to try out Altium Designer for yourself, you can get a free trial of the software by going to altium.com slash yt slash philslab. Before we get started, I would suggest to look at my previous videos on IIR filters and the Z transform before watching this video. This will give some background on digital filters and some of the maths used in this video. To start with, we'll cover the basics of notch filters, what they are and why they are useful. Then we'll look at an analog electronic prototype in the form of an RLC filter and derive the governing mathematical model of our filter. Since you wish to implement the notch filter in a digital or discrete time system, we'll need to discretize our model mathematically. Before implementation, we'll look at some practical considerations. And lastly, we'll use C and an STM32 microcontroller to test out our notch filter using the little brain board. So let's get started. Notch filters, sometimes also referred to as the band stop or band reject filters, exist both in analog electronics as well as in digital signal processing systems. We'll actually be looking at both in this video. Notch filters essentially exist to provide a near infinite attenuation to a certain frequency. That is, they pass all frequency components except for a very narrow band of frequencies, which they attenuate severely. Effectively, notch filters are some combination of high and low pass filters. You can see a typical notch filter's frequency response over here, where I've plotted the gain and the phase of the filter versus frequency. You can see the gain is one for the most part, meaning that low and high frequencies are relatively unaffected. However, at around 50 Hz, the filter gain drops severely to near zero. This is what we refer to as the center frequency of the notch. Around this center frequency, so on the left and right of this, the filter attenuates as well, but less severely. This is then what we call the width of the notch and is the second design parameter in this type of filter. The phase, on the other hand, remains near zero, away from the center frequency, both on the left and the right side. However, at the center frequency, we get what looks like resonant behavior, and we'll see why in just a bit. Notch filters are incredibly useful in many different applications. For example, in filtering out mains frequency noise, which is typically 50 or 60 hertz, from power supplies, suppressing motor vibrations at a certain frequency when we're performing measurements with an accelerometer, for example, and they can be found in many audio equalizers in audio equipment. Let's look at the notch filter from an analog electronics view. In essence, it's a second order RLC filter. Basically, it's a potential divider with a resistor forming the upper part and the combination of inductive and capacitive reactants forming the lower part. We provide a voltage at our input at the one end of the resistor and measure the voltage at the output at the other end. Remembering basic electronics theory, the inductor's reactance, or AC resistance loosely speaking, is dependent on frequency and is equal to J omega L. Omega is the angular frequency in radians per second, which is related to the frequency F in hertz by two pi. I'll be substituting S for J omega, which is the Laplace transform variable for the remainder of this video. The capacitor's reactance, also dependent on frequency, is one over SC. We'll assume an ideal circuit and thus no source resistance and no loading at this circuit's output. Before we get into the mass of the circuit, let's get a brief intuitive understanding of it. Over here, at very low frequencies, around DC, the inductor is effectively a short circuit, and the capacitor is an open circuit. Thus, there's no load on the resistor, and no voltage is dropped across it. This means that the output voltage is pretty much equal to the input voltage, and we have a filter gain of 1. Conversely, at AC and very high frequencies over the right here, the inductor is effectively an open circuit, again meaning there is no load on the resistor and the output voltage is equal to the input voltage. The filter here also has a gain of one. However, around one certain frequency, the series combination of reactances of the inductor and capacitor will be much smaller than the resistance of the resistor and pretty much close to zero. This happens at resonance, i.e. when the reactances cancel each other out. Here the output is essentially shunted to ground and we get a filter gain of zero. None of the input voltage passes to the output. 
Once we have an intuitive understanding of the behavior of this filter, we can approach it mathematically. As usual, we will use Kirchhoff's current law, KCL for short, and assume equal current flow through the resistor as well as through the inductor and capacitor. Setting up our equation, we get V in minus V out over R is equal to V out over the series reactance of the inductant capacitor. We can substitute for the reactances, then rearrange for the filter gain, which is V out over V in, to give the transfer function of this filter. The transfer function is of second order and can be written in somewhat of a standard form over here. The center of the notch is denoted by omega naught, and the width of the notch is denoted by omega w. We can see that the center of the notch is actually due to a pair of zeros and due to the resonance of the inductor and capacitor given by square root 1 over LC. The width of the notch, on the other hand, is determined by the resistance and the inductance and can also be seen as some form of damping. Here are some example frequency responses for a notch filter with a 50 Hz center frequency. On the left, I've plotted the filter using a 5 Hz notch switch, and on the right, one with a wider 20 Hz notch switch. Of course, using a smaller notch width gives a much more selective filter. Notice that also with a wider notch width, the band around the center frequency is somewhat asymmetrical. Now that we have derived a mathematical model for an analog continuous time notch filter, we're ready to take the next step. That is, we would like to implement a notch filter in software on a digital discrete time system. Reasons for this are typically flexibility, meaning we can change filter parameters on the fly in real time without redesigning the circuitry, as well as typically lower cost and no problems with component tolerances and so forth. However, to do this, we need to discretize our notch filter transfer function. That is, we need to take our continuous time model, which in essence is in the form of a differential equation and convert it to discrete time. This means figuring out a difference equation that we can implement programmatically. For the remaining slides, I will assume we're implementing this filter on a system with a fixed sample time capital T, which is in seconds. Now there are several ways of going from an analog prototype to a discrete time model of that analog prototype. For filters, typically one of the best methods is called the Tustin or bilinear transform or transformation. This actually will give us the best frequency domain match between systems, which is definitely what we want for most filters. Alternatively, the Euler method can be used and is typically easier to derive, but performs far worse in this case. Before we continue, I'd urge you to watch the video on my channel covering the Z transform, as I'll assume prior knowledge for the next part. Essentially, to apply the Tustin transform, we need to replace all S's with this expression over here. Then we rearrange to form a discrete time transfer function in the Z domain. And finally, we can use that to give our difference equation. I've done the maths for you since it would otherwise take up a fair bit of time in this video. We can make our lives a bit easier by defining two constants, alpha and beta, which are defined up here. Substituting the expression for the Tustin transform as shown before yields the discrete time transfer function in the Z domain. Since we aren't really working with voltages anymore, I've renamed our input and output variables to X and Y respectively. Remember, we are working in discrete time now with samples, so the index N denotes the sample number. By noting that Z is simply the sample shift operation, we can arrive at this difference equation down here. This is the linear discrete time constant coefficient difference equation of a second order notch filter, and in essence, is the discrete time version of our analog electronic RLC prototype. We can pretty much use this equation directly to implement a notch filter in software. Before we continue, however, the Tustin transform, which was our chosen discretization method, has some peculiarities that come with using it. I won't go into detail here, and we'll leave a link in the description of this video for more information, but we need to do what's called a pre-warp of the significant frequency of our filter. In our case, this is the center frequency of our notch. This pre-warping ensures a matched frequency response as otherwise the response would be shifted by an amount. We can pre-warp our notch frequency by plugging it into this equation and then use the pre-warp frequency in our final filter implementation. Now let's compare our analog and digital filter frequency responses. On the left, we can see the Bode plot of our analog and digital filters without pre-warping. The red trace is the analog prototype and the blue trace is the discretized digital system. As you can see, the frequency domain fit is already pretty good but there's a definite offset between the responses. On the right, we can see the Bode plot of both filters again. 
However, this time with pre-warping of our center frequency. Now the fit is near identical, which is much better. This is exactly what we want when discretizing our system and the reason for choosing the Tustin transform. As usual, before going straight to the implementation, we'll need to think of a few practical considerations. Firstly, in discrete time and when sampling signals, we're bandwidth limited by the Nyquist frequency. In effect, this means that our sampling frequency, which is one over our sampling time t, needs to be at least twice as high as the frequency of interest. Ideally, and in the real world, the sampling frequency should be much higher. Secondly, we will have to choose our center frequency and notch width of our filter. The center frequency is easy to choose and is usually governed by the problem you are trying to solve. On the other hand, the notch width may require some empirical experimentation to get right. Remember also that wider notches have a more skewed frequency response. Thirdly, we haven't really looked at the time domain behavior so far. We've only considered frequency domain characteristics and there will be trade-offs with the time domain response. For instance, the settling time, overshoot, and so forth. Lastly, there are various issues that arise when implementing dynamic systems on a processor with a limited number of bits to represent numbers. This could be quantization, Randolph error, stability, and so forth. Additionally, there may be issues with processing speeds depending on the filter complexity. Now we're ready to implement our notch filter on a real-time embedded system using an SCM32F4 microcontroller. Please see my previous videos and check out my Git repo to see how the basic firmware of this board was constructed. Here we now are in STM32 Cube IDE, where we will be doing the practical implementation of our notch filter. There's already quite a lot to the Little Brain firmware, and you can check out my previous videos on how I came up with the drivers for the sensors, the basic firmware, and so forth. For our notch filter, we'll simply be making a header file and an accompanying source file, which we can then include in our main.c file. Bear in mind that this is a very crude implementation of this filter and there's many, many optimizations you can do to get this running more elegantly, faster, and so forth. But for the purposes of demonstration, this is absolutely fine. I like to have a struct in which I can store my filter coefficients, as well as my input samples and output samples. Then I typically have two functions. One is to initialize the filter, compute the coefficients through the pre-warping and so forth. And one is an update function that actually computes the new filter output sample. So let's go through in the notchfilter.c file to see how that's done. The initialization function takes a pointer to the struct, the center frequency in hertz, the notch width in hertz, as well as the sample time that we will be calling this filter with. The first thing we need to do is convert the filter frequencies from hertz to angular frequencies in radians per second. That is simply by multiplying the frequency in hertz by two pi. Then we need to pre-warp the center frequency. And all I'm doing is using this expression over here and implementing that in software. So it's two divided by the sample time times the tan of a half the sample time times our not pre-warped center frequency in radians per second. And that's all there is to it. Remember before going to the difference equation, I pre-computed some filter coefficients or some constants that we use a lot in our filter. That's what I've stored in the struct here. So alpha and beta is simply four times omega naught times t all squared. Beta is two times omega w times t. Then also the last part of my initialization is actually to clear the input and output arrays and store zeros in those arrays. So we have defined values. Now we can move over to our notch filter update function, which computes the latest output sample. Again, this is a very crude implementation, but for the purposes of demonstration, I think this is a bit better. The first thing we need to do is shift the samples. Every time we get a sample in, we need to shift the samples through our array. So the oldest sample gets thrown away and replaced by the previous sample and so forth. So we do that for the input array and for the output array. Then we have to store the newest input, which is passed by the float, into our latest input sample. Then we are ready to compute the output sample. And the way we do that is simply by implementing this difference equation. Rearrange so we have y of n on one side and everything else on the other side. And that's all I've done here. So you can see all the terms to do with x, alpha x naught plus 2 times alpha minus 8 times the previous input sample plus alpha times the previous previous input sample. Then I have to subtract from that these two terms over here, which I've done on the next line. And finally, because I want yn, the latest output sample on its own, I have to divide the whole side by alpha plus beta, which is what I've done here. And that is a really easy way of implementing this notch filter. Then we simply return the filtered output, and that's it.
In the main.c function of this little brain board, I've then included the notch filter header file. I've made some definitions of the filter center in hertz, the width of the notch, as well as the sample time. Then I need to define my notch filter struct, and then of course initialize my notch filter, passing the struct and the relevant design parameters. At a fixed sampling rate, in this case, every 10 milliseconds, I will generate a, so to speak, fake input to my filter, which is just a sinusoid. This lets us test different frequencies and see how the filter responds to those frequencies. So we go from one to five hertz every 10 seconds and then wrap around. Then I compute my input sinusoid and input that into my notch filter and get the output. Finally, I use the virtual COM port of this STM32 microcontroller, print both the raw input data and the filtered output data via USB. I'm using this serial oscilloscope and I'll leave a link to that in the description. So I connect to my virtual COM port, the program is running, you can see my sample rate is 100 hertz. Then I can open my serial oscilloscope. So here at a frequency of one hertz, the filter is passing pretty much all the components. We have a slight phase shift, but that's quite normal. Now we're gonna go over to two hertz, which is the notch center frequency of this filter. After initial transient, the filter output dies down and we can see we have almost infinite attenuation of this red input signal. Then moving to three hertz, we can see we are still in the notch width, which means we have a slight bit of attenuation still, but again, the notch is very narrow, so three hertz gets passed quite nicely. Now we're at four hertz, and you can see we're pretty much outside of the notch, and we get no attenuation and no phase shift as we predicted with our model. So thank you very much for watching this video. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below, and I look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thanks again.